All right. Next up, we have Alexander Ivanov, who is, as Bowen mentioned, no stranger to CEMS. He comes to us you know, locally here from Northeastern and has been in the area now for quite some time. If you want to hold that, it's... it's... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so Nikolai, uh, or sorry, <laughs> Alexander here will be talking to us now about some uh, glycomics of single cells. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you, Nikolai, for your um, kind invitation. It is a pleasure to be here once again. So after many, uh, quite a few years, uh, I'm excited to present our data. Uh, is it here? Yes. Uh, and uh, 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 pay attention. So th this is the title of this talk. It is a toyish title, but it is a statement. As you've seen um, during the conference, there is pretty much no censorship yet uh, with the conference. But um, somebody took this uh, statement or my title with a grain of salt and uh, maybe with a reason or without. And if you check the program, there is a question mark added to this <laughs> question. I'm not pointing fingers to a uh, takeaway, but <laughs> just guessing. <laughs> anyway. Um, and not to be a stranger uh, in a single cell conference and um, not to just dive into the glycomic story right away, I decided to jump in two stories into uh, this presentation. And thanks a lot for uh, hanging in here at six or five or something like that. Thank you. So uh, I'll start off with um, our <clears throat> Uh, with an overview of our recent work on top-down proteomics using CEMS, and then I'll switch to glycomics. And uh, these are the heroes of the this work who did pretty much everything. Yun Fan, Kendall, and Lee Somak, Michal, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, so to, to begin with, uh, all these stories were covered already uh, during the conference. So a needs for uh, limited sample analysis, single cell analysis. You are guys probably tired of single cell proteomics already. You look forward to get some news about single cell glycomics, but nevertheless, all these techniques uh, uh, that are developed for single cell proteomics are applicable to other limited samples. Neonatal, small animal models, what have you. So, uh, an incomplete list here. Many of those applications were discussed already. Uh, I'm bringing uh, this up again and again. And Ryan Kelly yesterday uh, uh, discussed this point, uh, which we are quite relying on in my lab. We are uh, we like to use and we are we like de developing. Uh, techniques based on ultra-low flow separations. And base, uh, this is a simple example of what happens if you decrease the flow rate from about uh, 60 nanoliters per minute to 20 nanoliters per minute for the same sample. Signal to noise goes up, uh, ion sep ionization suppression goes down, uh, ion utilization goes up, and uh, ionization efficiency is increasing. And in my lab, we are using uh, different modalities of separations, and uh, there is a nice uh, segue on CMS, which I'll mostly be talking about today, but also we are using conventional LC packed with beads, uh, open tubular columns and monolithic columns uh, polymerized in the lab. So the concept here, uh, which we published on a couple of years ago, but uh, I think it will uh, work as an introduction uh, to, to the second topic of the presentation, is to use a single cells is the, uh, as containers of their own molecular contents and to bring uh, an intact single cell right into the separation device, uh, let's say into the cap capillary. Lies there, and the, the most simplistic, uh, we thought, would be to analyze intact proteins this way. So, and uh, uh, Yun Fan and Kendall actually did that uh, and we use two approaches to inject cells into the capillary. Either we applied high voltage, 
to, to generate electrospray as soon uh, as uh, the electrospray was generated. So it uh, also generated the flow of the background electrolyte through the capillary and uh, initiated suction of cells from the slide. Uh, this way, we could time our injection or electrospray-driven uh, injection, uh, but we could not get to a uh, precise injection of individual cells. Let's say if we inject one, one minute, we approximately get two, sometimes three, sometimes four cells, depending on the spot. Uh, if you inject for two minutes, uh, so we double or triple that. But in order to uh, inject individual cells, uh, we use hydrodynamic uh, injection, but uh, in this case manually, we are working toward uh, automation and uh, injected cell by cell. If we needed to inject a single cell, we injected one cell, uh, five, ten, whatever we wanted to do. And, uh, uh, and then uh, we learned how to visualize uh, the cells using uh, fluorescent eyes, bright, bright field microscopy, and uh, uh, we checked whether we are lysing the cells, and uh, in this case, we had to use one plug over the lysis buffer formic acid in this case. Uh, and uh, it, it takes, it, with one plug, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds to lyse the cell. With two plugs surrounding the uh, cell, it pretty much happens instantaneously. Uh, and with that story, uh, expectedly, we didn't cover a huge dynamic range. Mostly, uh, we found proteins and protoforms uh, of high abundance, but uh, some of them from time to time were from intermediate me uh, and medium abundance. Uh, of course, we, we, we uh, <clears throat> didn't ha have huge coverage, but that was the very first work on top-down proteomics of single cells. That's why I wanted to bring it up and emphasize. And um, uh, we, we saw correlations in the number of protoforms identified uh, from the uh, cell size with the positive correlation here. And I'm quickly going through this story. Um, uh, what Ronald was talking about with histone codes very, is very important. Even with this limited coverage, we saw many histones and actually intact histones with multiple modifications, protoforms. Some of them are uh, pretty uh, low abundance and uh, rarely detectable by LCMS methods, for example, butyryl uh, lysine and uh, others. So these are just examples, good, good uh, sequence coverage uh, at the level of uh, intact protoforms. And um, histones are quite good. They are uh, ion uh, easy to ionize, they're relatively small. And uh, here, are some initial proof of concept results that we can differentiate based on the quantitative analysis of single cells, different cell types. And we, we had to rush to publish this paper because of the competition, but we are <coughs> done with this story. Uh, then we thought that if we uh, can use the same type of an approach uh, in LCMS mode, and uh, Ryan Kelly uh, briefly mentioned yesterday porous layer open tubular columns, and Michal Gregush in my lab is working on those. We are just splitting the flow to use a regular LC setups, LC systems to get down to 20 nanoliters per minute. And we, we polymerize plot columns. I'll show an image from the next slide. Um, one meter long, four meter long, three, whatever, we, we, different geometries. And we, we try to uh, inject intact cells, lyse them right there uh, on a trap column and analyze later. Also, we tried to see whether the FAMES interface, which is not, of course, like in terms of uh, uh, a, a, a real ion mobility, but it's rather ion mobility filtering device. So uh, we checked whether we can improve signal to noise and remove singly charged ions and the, uh, garbage and, uh, and decrease the background noise. And it worked for top-down um, proteomics. And that's how the column looks like with the layer, porous layer attached covalently to the, uh, to the capillary inner wall. So, and uh, FAMES helps get some, some more IDs, 30, 40% more IDs. I'm not going through uh, details, but interestingly, even at that level uh, of uh, 200 cells, HeLa cells injected, just lies uh, top down, we were able to get uh, to the level of 3,000 protoforms 
which is with, with one uh, dimension, without fractionation, uh, without using unlimited amount of sample. So uh, that was uh, pretty impressive for the start, uh, especially if you compare to the um, state of the art art in this field and uh, what is published by the leaders uh, of, in the field with unlimited sample amount and multiple fractionation techniques applied. So uh, that looks pretty promising to me. We are moving ahead with this. Michal is working actively on uh, this technology. In this case, for 200 cells, uh, the coverage and dynamic range was substantially wider, up to five orders of magnitude or so. And what was uh, more interesting that for uh, top down for intact protoforms, the reproducibility was pretty good and the peaks were, were very sharp and uh, thin. So, okay, we are using 60 minute long gradient here. Uh, we are not worried yet about throughputs. We, we are uh, developing it as a proof of concept to optimize at some point later. And if uh, <clears throat> Michal injects six cells on the trap column, lysis and uh, uh, analyzes, so we are getting some coverage, not that many yet protoforms, but that's uh, the very uh, first set of experiments. However, we are getting, again, uh, tons of histones and intact protoforms and modifications uh, detected uh, at uh, different proteins. Uh, a few examples here, there are many of them. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, also, since we are injecting only uh, six cells and uh, top-down proteomics, they, uh, we expect to see mostly high abundance proteins, but again, many intact histone proteoforms are detected with all these uh, uh, PTMs that are relevant to the histone code. Uh, when we examine uh, this set of data, uh, we uh, found out that there are <clears throat> uh, numerous peaks corresponding to axonium ions of glycans. So it means with uh, additional uh, search strategies added to this data analysis added, we should be able to get to glycan analysis as well, uh, which uh, brings me to the next story, glycomic analysis of single cells and uh, small sample amounts. So Yunfan and Liz and Somak, uh, thank you for your work and uh, help with, uh, with, this, uh, with this story. Uh, first of all, um, the current state of the art, or maybe current state of things. Single cell proteomics, uh, single cell transcriptomics is still exponentially growing in the number of citations and the number of publications. And if you move to single cell proteomics, thanks to uh, many people in this room and uh, uh, other researchers you know, around the globe. So it also shows a very similar trend in the number of citations and number of publications. However, we are probably eight, nine, seven years behind this trend. If you look at single cell multiomics, that's even further back, it, but it's still, it still, it, it begins to grow. And I, I think it will catch up, uh, proteomics will catch up with this, multiomics will catch up also with proteomics and so on. So things are moving and things are ex exponentially growing. However, if you look at single cell glycomics, um, that's that's the uh, current current state of things. And I think we published a paper in 2022, just mentioned single cell glycomics, <laughs> that, that, that was picked up with the citations and that's what we see here. Uh, anyway, why to study glycans? Why uh, they should be interesting and why we should expect similar trends at some point later? We are not there yet, as you see. Um, so in cancer, different cancers. So uh, here are a few examples from the literature. They, uh, uh, glycosylation, different types of glycosylation. It can go up, down. Uh, uh, it can be very diagnostic uh, for detecting uh, cancers. Uh, glycocalyx on the cell surface is extremely important for cell-to-cell -cell communication and recognition. Uh, and those things, hairy uh, things there, uh, built mostly of glycans, proteoglycans, lipolipids, and so on. And uh, currently, there is a new trend in developing glycan targeting, targeted 
uh, therapeutics. So in a, a, on the next slide, so different types of glycans, different types of li link uh, linkages, I'm not going into uh, details here, but um, some groups, and actually a group of uh, Caroline Bertozzi, who recently got a Nobel Prize, uh, they are developing uh, bi biotherapeutics to target cell elation, for example, and change the uh, pattern of glycosylation on the cell to make it accessible to immune cells, which is uh, a pretty new development in the field of uh, biotherapy developments. So previously, we started um, our journey towards glycans, glycan analysis, and I tried to stay away from glycans for quite some time. Finally, we got into that. We started with, uh, with using a commercial kit. Uh, oh, it works, try it. We got one kit, we got, we got different kits. And as you may know, the majority of um, gly glyca analysis are conducted using divertization different kits, either positive labels or uh, negative labels to improve retention, ionization, uh, UV absorption, fluorescence, whatever detection. Uh, and since we use mass spectrometry as a detector, uh, we quickly realized that there's so many drawbacks on any divertization techniques. It can be incomplete divertization. It can be aberrant divertization. Some glycans are not labeled at all because they are highly cellulated, let's say, and we are using a negatively charged uh, um, divertization aid agent, which has been electrostatically repulsed from the, from the glycan. It doesn't label at all. And we saw it in mass spectrum ionization suppression, cleanup is needed and, and other things, as with any other divertization techniques. So, uh, Team T included. Um, so, then <clears throat> we tried, why don't we use native uh, glycans, uh, just release glycans and analyze without uh, labeling them, because we have a mass spectrometer. So, we use, uh, we tried it, and we had a very good luck in, in uh, increasing the sensitivity of detection analyzing uh, very tiny sample amounts like uh, picogram level, uh, sub nanoliter level of plasma or other isolates or, or um, standards, uh, glycans released from standards. Annalise and Yunfan worked on different <laughs> iterations of uh, the technique. So, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> and we were surprised to see, oh, we, we see over 200 uh, glycans and we can could quantify them uh, uh, using sub nanogram sample amount or picograms, uh, six, uh, 600 picogram in this case, and, and different types of glycans. I'm not going into details. We published it less than a year ago in Nature Communications. And another example here IgM, very tiny amounts, also picogram level. Um, of over 100 glycans, different stru structures, including highly cellulated glycans and highly fu fucosylated glycans. And typically, with uh, while we are labeling glycans, if we are labeling uh, glycans and uh, uh, processing samples quite in few uh, steps, uh, glycosylation and uh, fucosylation and cellulation can be easily lost. Here we didn't see that. So uh, we were encouraged with uh, that set of data, and uh, we used pretty much the same uh, approach that I discussed before. We injected <clears throat> uh, either a single cell into the capillary or some tiny amount, nanoliter volume, sub-nanoliter volume of, um, like, let's say, blood isolate or glycans released, not glycans released, but, but uh, other biological samples. I'll show a few examples. So uh, here, instead of uh, injecting a cell surrounded by uh, plugs of the lysis buffer, we injected the cell surrounded two by two plugs of PNGSF to release glycans right there in the capillary. So injected, uh, incubated in this case for about from 10 minutes to 30 minutes to 40 minutes, we played with, with the time. And then we use capillary electrophoresis coupled to mass spectrometry to analyze things. Uh, and we were surprised that we could go down again, total IgM isolate from serum, 3,000 3, picoliters here, going down to 60 picoliters, 
and still uh, about 100 glycans quantified IgG total isolates from, from uh, serum total plasma going down to uh, these volumes. Whether um, it is practically needed now, uh, so I don't know yet. So most likely it shows that uh, feasibility uh, to analyze very small sample amounts from ticks or babies or whatever. So uh, something to um, work on. And um, extracellular vesicles from serum, also very tiny amounts of vesicle isolates and then released glycans in the capillary. And uh, these, all these samples were derived from blood one way or another. And uh, expectedly, we thought that we would, we would see um, a lot of contamination from blood and uh, which will be masking differences between the samples, which is not the case. So they are quite different. The, the glycan profiles, quantitative profiles are very different from one sample type to another. If you look uh, closer at the fractional distributions of fucosylation and uh, cellulation, mono and uh, poly, of fucosylation and cellulation. Between different samples, the splits are different. I will not go through one to another. <laughs> and that what we also noticed, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> when we inject a cell and we are surrounded with the PNGSF and release glycans, and we monitored under the microscope the cells, and we saw that it doesn't lose its integrity. It sits right there. We didn't fix cells, at, it mean, uh, we, we didn't um, change any, uh, we didn't use any cross-link, it means that we didn't close any pores, so it doesn't mean that there is no crosstalk uh, between the uh, cytosol, let's say, and the external uh, exterior uh, space around the cell, but uh, we think that the majority of glycans that we release are coming from this surface. And we are using native or near native conditions. They are very mild, very gentle, uh, that the enzyme works well without destroying the cell. That means that potentially it can be used for multi omic sample analysis down the road. So, and if you look at CMS ion <coughs> density maps, 10 cells, five cells, one cell, of course, the number of glycan features shown in these blue streaks and blue dots it kind of decreases. And uh, of course, we, uh, it, we, show, uh, we, we have a correlation, um, direct proportionality, of course, the number of cells versus the abundance and number of features we can detect. Uh, since we are using a negative ion mode, we were able to get very informative, structurally informative spectra. Uh, we could decipher linkages, uh, differentiate isoforms, and uh, get cross link, uh, cross, cross, um, what's it? <laughs> uh, cross ring uh, fragmentation to, to see the, uh, the actual structures in many cases. So uh, the software is underdeveloped that requires more work, but, but the spectra are very informative. Also, what is important that the migration patterns can be used uh, potentially with AI and other searching techniques to validate identities of glycans because they highly correlate to the charge and also hydrodynamic radius of the glycan. So if you look at two different cell types and they're quite different here and U cells, uh, cervix cells and um, uh, glioblastoma cells, I'm not a cell biologist, they look the same to me on a 2D uh, plane. If we detach them or grow them in suspension, they also look pretty much the same. Slight variations, some differences in uh, cell size. If you inject them into the capillary, they also look the same. We wanted to see whether we can differentiate glycans uh, on those. And in this case, if you inject HeLa, one, five, 10 cells, you see the split of fractional distributions of specific glycans, either fucosylated or uh, cellulated, are pretty much the same. We are just <laughs> sorry, getting more and more multi-fucosylated, uh, multi multi-cellulated glycans because they are low abundance. And we are just increasing more, injecting more, we are, we are increasing the signal. And, um, <clears throat> but if you compare, let's say, HeLa to you, uh, 87 cells, 
and a look at fucosylation or, or cellulation patterns, they are quite different even by the distributions. If you look uh, further and again compare HeLa and U cells, uh, they are different by PCA, they are different by non-supervised hierarchical clustering. Uh, if you inject one cell, HeLa cell, five, ten, we see more glycan fe features, which is expected. But interestingly, for single U cells, we, we detect about 90 glycans versus about 20 glycans. So cells are different. Glycosylation on the surface are very different. And there, I'm not going through details, but some of them uh, here, selected glycans, are either the same, the same or different in abundance. <coughs> and then uh, more cells, uh, clear differentiation, HeLa and U based on the quantitative uh, characterization. And here we started, uh, Yun Fan started uh, treating cells with LPS. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see a clear cut separation with treated, non-treated, but keeping the separation of U from HeLa cells or U from HeLa cells quite a bit. Uh, but we saw changes in fucosylation and cellulation based on the treatment uh, for both uh, cell types and uh, some, some differentiation in PCA and uh, uh, numbers of glycans detected. So basically, to drive this message, so we are getting to <laughs> the state where uh, uh, we, we can open this uh, barber shop for cells, so bring the cells into the lab. Uh, they might be uh, nice or ugly, uh, covered with all these weird glycans. We'll shave them all off in the capillary, analyze them nicely, keeping the glycans intact, cells happy, and uh, ready to be analyzed uh, in the next uh, uh, set of multi-omic analysis. With that, uh, several points to drive in. Uh, so uh, ultra-low flow separation has the potential to increase uh, the sensitivity of analysis, <laughs> mass spectrometry analysis. Uh, proof of concept uh, status, Fine, we didn't we, we cannot analyze 1,000 cells or 10,000 cells yet. But remember that curve, the exponential growth curve, with some funding, some more resources, that will happen. Uh, and uh, uh, in capillary processing has the potential, we showed it for top-down proteomics, for glycan analysis, uh, keeping very mild conditions and um, got about 100 cells or, or, or over 100 glycans analyzed per cell, in, uh, in this case, U cell. Um, preserving integrity is important. So potentially it opens the door to multi-omic analysis. And also uh, these studies focus on protoform characterization, PTM characterization, uh, glycomes may open doors to developing a new diagnostic application, clinical application, and uh, glycan-targeted therapeutics. With these, I would like to thank uh, my lab members, specifically Annalise, Yun Fan, Kendall Somak, Michal, and actually Gunivir, who visited my lab in 2017. She, she helped us start the glycan analysis. She visited for three or four, I don't know, five months, and that, that was the beginning of the story. Uh, collaborators from different places, Sykes, Thurma, and other academic collaborators funding. And uh, with that, uh, currently I'm on sabbatical. I would like to thank the Steve Carr's lab at the Broad Institute. They're very helpful. We are, we are uh, running the study between uh, about 20 labs on uh, top-down proteomics by Kepler electrophoresis with Kevin and Leanne Lian. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for really exciting work. Uh, we're running towards the end of our program, but I want to allow time for a couple questions. Do you have any from the audience? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, I can see one of the approaches on studying like comics is cancer, but I had the question, uh, have you ever thought of congenital glycosylation disorders as models for expanding research on glycomics? Um, absolutely. So they're, they're uh, neurodegenerative diseases. They're uh, infectious diseases. They're all possible diseases where uh, uh, heart uh, failures, glycosylation changes quite rapidly. 
Uh, currently, we are developing the technology and we are trying to move forward with automation and making it more robust and uh, open for mul multiple samples. But uh, potential applications, yeah, we are not closing it to cancer. And by the way, I forgot to mention that the uh, uh, latest paper was published two or three weeks ago in Nature, uh, Nature uh, Communications. If you are interested, take a look. Alexander, I found your results with top-down analysis using plot columns quite impressive. And I wonder if you if you have a sense of what is limiting to push to push them even further. Do you know if you detect multiple features that are not yet identified? What fraction of the features do you identify? Are you limited by fragmentation spectra, by resolving precursors? Uh, All of these, that's also a possibility. It's a very tough area, so it's impressive to see the progress, but I wonder if you can isolate what are some of the main challenges. Uh, the current challenge, the main challenge is the bandwidth or the lack of uh, the bandwidth and limitation in resources. Michal's time and uh, uh, um, most likely uh, reinforcing this project and putting more energy into that uh, weekly, which we are trying to do now. It seems that I'm getting uh, fund, uh, some funding to help it out. We'll uh, move it forward because I, I think we just started exploring things and uh, uh, all the list, all the listed uh, possible limitations might be there right now. I think uh, I, I'll uh, tell you maybe the, uh, one other thing, um, one major limitation in top-down proteomics um, using reverse phase chromatography uh, under acidic conditions at pH 2. We see mostly, I didn't um, uh, brought up that point. So uh, the range of proteins was from pretty small ones up to 28 kilodalton. Maybe uh, improving that, potentially we'll increase it, oh, let's say 35 or whatever, but uh, maybe moving to native, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be able to increase the um, mass range and cover uh, larger proteins. Right now, we are mostly limited, maybe it's this ma major technical limitation related to mass spectrometry. Thank you.